I start this discussion of the philosophical basis for an African curriculum with a number of initial statements. Uh, being born in the United States of America, I know that the United States itself was born with two birth defects. One was the genocide of the native peoples, and the other one was the enslavement of the Africans. It has acquired over many years other defects uh, rooted in the large gap between propaganda and reality, what people say or what they write and what they do. It was necessary for Europeans in the United States and even those in Europe to attack Africa at the very core in order to advance a curriculum of European supremacy. Else, neither enslavement nor colonialism was possi were, were possible. But we have been the negation in the United States, the black population has been the negation to the negation of our history. And so we have overturned the comfort of the racist by questioning their morality and their facts. This has been the long struggle. I wrote a book uh, some years ago, 10 years or more, called uh, The uh, uh, African American History, uh, a, an Odyssey or a Quest for Liberation, which has been, of course, the principal myth of the African population in the United States. On the other hand, Africa, the continent, and the nations in it, represents the original home of the human species. Africa is where Homo sapiens learn the elementary responses to each other and to the environment. And humans lived in Africa for two-thirds of the time that Homo sapiens have been in existence. It is easy to say that Africa is not only the home of the mother and father of humanity, but the home of the mother and father of civilization. The oldest math calculators found in the world are found uh, in the Lubombo bone in Swaziland. 28,000 years ago, the Africans began to mark uh, the period of women. In Congo, the Isonge bone 20,000 years ago represent the second of the oldest mathematical calculators that we have in human history. So this is to set the tone for this discussion, which I hope to uh, cover many aspects of uh, the trouble with understanding Africa, because by virtue of Europe's engagement with Africa, at a very negative level, it has also impacted and affected people throughout the world, even in Asia. I see the same uh, experience. That is the experience of, of Europe having colored the minds of Asians regarding Africa. Uh, this is why, for example, a gentleman gave me the other day, two days ago, uh, a list of religions uh, in the world. And there was no African religion listed. And that is because simply one assumes that there are no African religions. And we assume that by virtue of the white racist supremacist attitude that was launched against Africa at the very beginning to assault and attack the humanity of African people. Otherwise, this notion of the enslavement of Africans would have created many psychological problems. In fact, it did and still does. The main trope of the imperialist and European supremacist was colonization of information. It's not just simply the colonization of people and territory, but of information about that territory. Africa, in order to establish a proper curriculum, must resist this tendency uh, even more now that our curricula uh, when you look at the curriculum at all of the universities, you see the same imitation, the same repetition of Europe. So that uh, it is rare, and I've 
lived in Africa, traveled throughout the continent, trained the first journalist after the Chimaranga in Zimbabwe, and yet I have never seen an African university in Africa. And I'm sure you have Asian universities in Asia, but we don't have African universities in Africa. We have imitation European universities. And almost all of the ones that are considered great and good are basically copies of European universities. So the, the issue with the curriculum in an African university must be one that starts at the beginning. We may have to reconstruct entire universities. And we can do this, but we have to have the will to do it. And we must know what we are doing. Let me just tell you where we must start. We must start with chronology. That is essential. We must start with chronology in African universities. We must understand that Nubia and Kemet are to Africa as China and India are to Asia and Greece and Rome are to Europe. You have to start there. If you do not start in an African university with Kemet, which is the African name for Egypt, Egypt is the Greek name for the land, if you do not start with Kemet and Nubia, you cannot start properly with an African curriculum. It does not exist. Because what we find in Africa is that most of the universities start with Greece. But this is problematic. 2,500 years before this era, 2,500 years before this era, the Africans had completed the building of the pyramids. 2,500 years before this era. That's like almost 5,000 years ago. The pyramids were up. In 2,500 BC, if you use that designation, there was no Greece. It didn't exist. 2,500 before this era, there was no Rome. It did not exist. So why would an African university start its curriculum from the Greeks? You know, you think the Africans were waiting around for the Greeks before they built the pyramids? You know, people waiting say, you know what, the Greeks are not here yet. We can't do anything. We have to wait till they come. And when they come, they will give us some wisdom and knowledge and teach us geometry. No. That is not the story. The story has to be that at the very beginning of the history of the African civilizations, African people on that continent itself had already, by 2500 BC, finished the last of the Great Pyramids. They're up. Started around 2900 BC, but by 2500, they're finished. There's no, no Greece. There is the Chinese dynasty of the Shia. There's Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. There's Nubia. There's no Greece. It does not appear. It appears in 1000 BC when we hear, hear the first voice of intelligence from the Greece, Greeks. And that's Homer. And it wasn't very deep stuff at that. It was, it's not serious, but it's elevated. A thousand BC. This is like 1,500 years after the pyramids are finished. So then you get Homer. And so everything starts now. This is a false chronology. It's a very bad. No civilization among the Greeks predated Nubia or Kemet. So why would African universities start there? More, there's more literature written in Africa. This is another one of the arguments that they have made. 
Well, you know, in Africa, they don't have any literature. And I hear, I hear people make that all, there's no literature. There's more writing in ancient Africa than in ancient Greece or Rome. You can combine Greece and Rome and not have the writing in the Nile Valley. If you take the ancient writings of Nubia and Aksum and Kemet, you have far more writing than you get from the Greeks and the Romans. But if you're trying to deny Africa its place in the sun, or African people, their humanity, you must try as hard as you can to wipe this out. Fundamentally, I wrote, uh, I've written 72 books, but I wrote early books on African culture and African history. And in one of the books, I wrote about the ancient African philosophers, uh, whose names we rarely hear. Imhotep. Patahotep, Dwarf, Amenemhat, Mary Kari, we know maybe Akhenaten, Kununup. These were philosophers that lived more than 1,500 years before the first Greek philosopher. Who was the first Greek philosopher? Thales of Miletus. And where did he go to school? In Africa. In fact, when Pythagoras was 19 years old, Pythagoras went to Thales and said to him, teach me what you know about philosophy. And Thales says to Pythagoras, you must do as I have done and go and learn philosophy in Egypt. This is, that is the story. But then why do we start with Thales and Pythagoras? Why don't we know Dwarf and Amenemhat? Why have not we read Patahotep on aging? And if you have an African university, and an African university is not engaged in this process, then what process is the university engaged in except the promotion of white supremacy? No, I'm a great negation to that. I have always been. I think that this is the problem with African education. Plato and Eudoxus both studied in Saïs. Herodotus, in the fifth century, wrote about Egypt in the histories. If you go read a copy, even now, you read a copy of Herodotus, you are amazed at all the things that the Greeks really got from Africa. In fact, this is why George James writes in his book, Stolen Legacy. This was a Guyanese professor who wrote a book in the 1950s that there is no Greek philosophy. That if you look at the Greek system, what they did was to distort African philosophy. Stolen Legacy. You should get this book. 1954 he writes this. And this is why we were able to create black studies, as it was called, in the United States, or now Africana studies, is because we convinced the ac academicians that they had been teaching lies, that what they had been promoting was a Eurocentric notion of the world, the imposition of their particularism as if it were universal. And we would sit in the classrooms, and we would listen to them talk about the Greek, if you start anything, any discussion on politics, what they say, Plato. You say, well, what about theater? They say, oh, Sophocles. So, so there was a Greek at every corner. And yet, these Greeks sitting at the doors of every avenue of knowledge were but children to Africa and to India and to China.